Modern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute, CRI, and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's June 2023, and you're listening to episode 343, which is a conversation about the book, Beautiful Union, How God's Vision for Sex Points Us to the Good, Unlocks the True, and Sort of Explains Everything by Joshua Ryan Butler a.k.a. Josh Butler. This book was published in June of 2023. Today's guest is Anne Kennedy. She has an MDiv and is the author of Nailed It! 365 Readings for Angry or Worn Out People. Anne blogs about current events and theological trends at standfirminfaith.com and on her substack, Demotivations with Anne. Anne has written an online exclusive book review article for the Christian Research Journal, and her article is called The Upside Down Metaphor, and you can read her review of Beautiful Union for free on our website, equip.org. Anne, it's good to have you on the podcast again. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, as I mentioned, Anne has written a review for us of a new book, that is called Beautiful Union. It's about Christianity and sexuality, is a Christian sexual ethic, and it's by a pastor named Josh Butler. Now, I would like to ask him a little bit about Josh Butler and this book uh, before we talk about the content of the book, because if people are the sort who are online, they will have noticed or might have noticed there was a big controversy and brouhaha in March earlier this year about this book, which originated with an excerpt that was published on the Gospel Coalition website. And over the course of a week, all kinds of things happened. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this controversy? And as a matter of fact, it got to be so controversial, even in the wider Christian world of all traditions, that on the American conservative Rod Dreher, who is an Eastern Orthodox uh, member of the Eastern Orthodox Church, he did quite a long blog post about this book and the ensuing brouhaha over it. It was pretty exciting week for the internet. I, I probably do count as being very online, definitely more online than I should be. And I saw the original article that went up on TGC I think probably the day it came out because people immediately started tweeting about it. And so mm -hmm. I got right online on my sub stack and wrote about that um, excerpt. And then uh, subsequently uh, we did, we, I mean, the whole world kind of the online world watched the spin uh, because first this, this part really did shock me. People who had written endorsements for the book when there was pushback, withdrew their uh, endorsements. So that was an, a very interesting question about how do how endo how do endorsements get made, um, and do people read the whole book when they when they agree to do one? And um, I f I did think that people should have probably stood by him. Um, anyway, that was a a part of a, the 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 fallout was that some endorsers pulled their endorsements and then he ended up resigning from the Keller center. And more recently he resigned from his job um, in his church in Arizona. He was, I think it's called, he was a lead pastor. Um, so probably one of the plurality of class pastors in something called um, redemption, a church. And so he's originally from Oregon I read, I came across him several years ago. I was sent a free copy of his book, The Pursuing God, which back then it wasn't nearly as troublesome as this one, but it was, I was uncomfortable at the time with how he talked about God and God's love for us. 
it's not that he said anything that was necessarily wrong. It was just he pushed the boundaries then of what I would have been you said with comfortable theological discourse about really essential matters. So, yes, he he faced fierce pushback about the book, about the excerpt that was on TGC. And then as people who have had a chance to read the book, uh, it came out, that excerpt came out before the book. Uh, people are still, I think, largely unhappy with what he's written. But he's been defending it on a variety of different um, platforms. And uh, he's, he's had some very interesting things to say. He's had really interesting conversations with people. Uh, but he really does stand by his work. And so that's also an interesting uh, phenomenon. And uh, yeah, I've, I haven't really lived through anything this exciting in the evangelical world in a while. And it this has been a, a shocking book to read. I had a difficult time with it. And um, very provocative, one could say. So I'm looking forward to talking about it a little bit today. It was quite the, um, I guess, what we would now call descent into being canceled online. And I do want to ask Anne a little bit about that because she has written an article for us before on this very topic. And you can find it on our website. You can read it. It's called Cancel Culture and the Gospel. Where can you go? when the whole world is against you. And what was interesting about just the enormous amount of negative feedback that he received was that both Christians, you know, evangelicals on the right and the left side of things theologically were quite troubled by his thesis and not so much his thesis, but how he kind of fleshed that out and how he really um, was kind of explicit in his descriptions and how he linked that to um, the gospel. And before we get into the details of the book, I do want to ask Anne about cancel culture because, you know, it was like they published, TGC published this excerpt, and then the outcry was so overwhelming from everyone that they said, you know, the next day, oh, I'm sorry, why don't you read it in its full context? Here's the whole chapter. There was still outcry after that whole chapter, the introduction of the chapter was published, that they removed both the excerpt and the chapter, and then subsequently published an apology by then President Julius Kim, who was the president at the time of the Gospel Coalition. And interestingly, Anne mentions the Keller Center, but some of our listeners may not know what that is. So there's, um, they might know that Tim Keller recently passed away, sadly, after a long battle with pancreatic cancer. But before that, uh, somewhat recently, there was a launch from the Gospel Coalition of a new kind of cohort or focus, they call the Keller Center for Cultural Apologetics. And so that's why at the time that they had asked um, Josh Butler to be part of this, because he was having a book coming out and he was going to kind of, I guess, be their spokesperson for a Christian sexual ethic that could be a cultural apologetic for non-believers. And you mentioned people withdrawing their endorsements and very interestingly, and that must have been difficult, is one of the other Keller Center fellows. So there's a whole bunch of fellows of which Josh Butler was one, and he tendered his resignation after the controversy. But one is another fellow pastor's wife of the Redemption set of churches in Arizona, and that was uh, Vermin Pierre's wife. And she gave a long um, reason, I think she posted on Twitter, why she walked back her endorsement, including, as you mentioned, not reading the entire book. And so that was all very interesting. But so that's some of the, the process of what happened. And so what was it like to go from maybe thinking, wow, everyone's going to embrace this particular excerpt of my book one day on, I think it was a Tuesday. And by Friday, you know, you've resigned from the Keller Center and everything altogether. I I do think is uh, there's there's the issue of the book itself and Butler. And then there is this this phenomenon that happens where... I don't I don't know if I would have called what happened about the 
the book itself a mob in this sort of, you know, well, I guess it's not traditional because we're, we're only forming them more recently online. So what happens in council culture is somebody says something that's offensive or deemed unacceptable and the poisonousness of it is that the thing can change day by day what's acceptable. So, you know, if you say something one day, but the next day it's not okay to say that, people will go back and found that you said it the day before and then you can be canceled, which means that you could lose your job, you could lose your um, relationships with people. I mean, there are real con- material consequences to being canceled today. Uh, especially when a, a, a mob online forms. And I have been really discouraged over the last many years to see Christians participate in this kind of forming of a, of a, a, a coalescing of a, a narrative and a, a discourse that then forces somebody out of some position or a church or something like that. And, and, and not for something like sin, you know, there are good reasons for people to lose their jobs for sure. But just because you have the wrong idea about something, or you said it the wrong way, and people dug around in your past and found that you were wrong about something. I, I, I think that kind of cancel culture is, is really, I mean, people have rightly called it toxic. And so I, I was really discouraged to see that begin to happen. And uh, although the the conversation around this book was so like a flame of fire, it was so intense. I do think uh, just for the sake of his family, it probably was a wise thing for him to step aside from some of his, I don't know about his church, but certainly the Keller Center and just definitely take a breather. I also have felt a a large amount of compassion for him because as I read the book, he relies on the main names of the day. Favorably, he quotes Sheila Gregoire. He quotes um, Karen Swell Pryor. He quotes uh, a lot of people who are writing about a lot of issues in the church today. And I think he assembled all these voices, um, and then he did say, I think he, he felt like he was saying something that everybody was also saying. He wasn't going out to say something that Christians don't say about sex. Um, I think that the, essentially, it is, of course, it's true that um, marriage is an icon of Christ in the church, or it's a picture of Christ in the church. Christians have all said that for a long time because St. Paul said it, so... <laughs> you know, he's, he, he, his project was, um, one that Christians have had through time and continue to discuss today. So, uh, I think he must have been really surprised at the pushback because he wasn't saying anything that, um, a lot of people haven't already said. And he, he, uh, he quoted so many people, who are writing and talking about these issues um, right now. So I feel for him because it, I, I imagine that he must have been surprised uh, about, about what happened. And at the same time, I'm, I'm shocked that this book came to press in the form that it did, that the Keller Center, you know, promoted it and him, uh, without having any sense that maybe there would be an immense amount of pushback? Like, why did it have to come to be Twitter that said, hey, this is really scary. (laughs) This is a really uh, interestingly worded um, or expressed picture of of what we have all been talking about for 2000 years. Uh, They didn't seem to have a problem with it until the, the, you know, the quote mob had a problem with it. So I just think there are layers of issues. There's the book itself. There's how it played out um, online. There's um, Josh Butler losing um, his job and his position at TGC and so on and so forth. And I, I, I hope that we come out of this maybe in a few months or years with a little bit more caution, a more circumspect view of how as Christians we can interact 
on the internet and about very difficult and important topics. I will say when you mentioned he quotes various people that are writing on that or who have a focus on that specifically, Sheila Gregoire, who has a focus of her ministry of sexuality and marriage in particular, is that the first excerpt that they printed uh, was very troubling. But then when they went to, here's, you know, the whole intro and the, and the first chapter, I, I would just um, tell people that they need to make sure that they're not skimming. They're actually reading and then check the footnotes because he favorably quotes Sheila Gregoire. And if you looked at the whole Twitter stream, all these people were going after him saying, did you, have you read Sheila Gregoire? And this is, you know, X, Y, and Z, and you're, you're doing this and she's, you know, this is the work that she's done. So I kind of feel like in people's, uh, in outrage, and it was outrage if you read the Twitter stream. It, it was very demoralizing to to read it over a few days. But if you read the outrage, you would see that I don't know that people actually carefully read the full excerpt of the book, for sure. And right, they didn't read the excerpt carefully, and obviously the people who endorsed the book didn't read it. And then, but he he has carefully read everybody else's work, so I don't know if he's fully understood what everybody's trying to say, but. Um, it seems like he's tried really hard to do his homework and to listen to what people are saying. And I, I, you know, he, he, he's attempting to be very pastoral and kind. All of the pushback that people had about, um, that he's, uh, I don't know if he was actually called a misogynist, but the way that he talks about sex disturbed a lot of people. And I don't think it's because he has a low view of women or that he's, um, you know, he doesn't care about abuse and things like that. That's obviously not true. If you read the book, uh, he cares obviously very deeply and he wants people to be happy and well and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, there's a, there, if, if anything, it's showed that we as a sort of online Christian quote community, uh, don't have good reading comprehension and are very quick to be up, upset without, um, thinking about things in a, in a good long time. Wait, don't skip this section of the podcast. I really want to ask a favor of you, and that is to write us a review or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts. Now, I know it's a temptation to skip this part of the podcast, which is only a few minutes long, because I know you want to get to this great discussion about this controversial book, Beautiful Union by Josh Butler, but we need your help. We need your help to get the word out about the podcast, and we really need people to know about us and download the podcast, and they can't really find us unless we have more ratings and reviews. And after seven years, we don't even have 100 reviews. So if all the time that you have to do is give us a starred review, we'll take it. But we really would appreciate you giving us a short review, just one or two sentences on your way over to Apple Podcasts. You can just think about why you like to listen to this podcast and please tell a friend about it. And in addition, you can always give us a tip that really helps us out to continue to provide these weekly exclusive articles on our website to you, which you can access and read. And you can give us a tip of maybe five, 10 or 15 bucks and do that at equip.org. Go to Journal, Postmodern Realities, and you'll find a link at any one of the landing pages. Plus, you can get the word out by just letting people know about the podcast or sharing your favorite episodes, links to those on your social media accounts or sending an email with that link. Now, back to the discussion with Ann Kennedy about Beautiful Union by Josh Butler. Well, now I want to ask you specifically about the book, and I thought this was very interesting, and that is... I did listen to Josh Butler's full um, Gospel Coalition seminar that he did back, I believe, in 2018. So it was like five years ago, which I think was the genesis of this book. And interestingly, in that talk that he gave, his entire thesis hasn't changed since he gave that talk, all the way down to the very examples that he used in the talk were also in the book. So I just wanted to ask you um, a little bit more about the book itself. And what does he say that he's going to do in the book? In other words, you said he has, you know, real pastoral reasons. Why, why would he write this particular book? Well, he 
I think is trying to rescue sex back from it, the destruction of what it, it, it properly is in our culture. And of course, Christians have a very, uh, are caught up in a lot of the, the dysfunctional and sinful ways of behaving that the world is. Um, so, you know, we can say that we have quote, a biblical sex, sexual ethic, but many Christians are caught up in pornography. There there's rampant divorce. Um, there's increasingly same sex relationships are coming into the church. And I think he's trying to rescue the, the, the theological vision for what sex is and give it to people in a way that they can understand. And that will change, you know, if, if you kind of understand what it's for, it won't feel so condemnatory perhaps to hear the church say, well, no, you can't have that kind of relationship or no, you shouldn't do that. And that's bad. (laughs) This other thing is also bad. So please, please stop doing all of those things. Of course, that feels pretty negative. So I think he, I think his project to make, to, to tell the, give the reason for why sex exists in theologically is a very good one. And obviously it needs to be done in this age. Um, He says himself that he's, he's going to show the the hidden mystery of of what sex is and paul um in ephesians 5 calls uh marriage the mystery between christ and the church or it's a picture of the christ relationship to the church and so he he likens sex to an icon which i uh don't want to really get into um because i'm not quite good on icon iconography and that that kind of uh, how that works um but he he wants he says wants to pull back the veil that's kind of that's hiding this mystery so that we can see through sex to the greater picture the greater vision of union with christ um, and he he talks about it in terms of salvation so uh, I, on the whole, I'm I'm for his project. I think that we, as as Christians, really do need to recover what's uh, you know something that God gave us as a gift. It does speak to who He is and who we are. It isn't just a sort of a, a thing that you can do. It it has spiritual implications, and it goes, of course, to the core of the person. So, uh, you know, out of the at, the, at the starting point, I, I was, you know, I'm, I'm not against what he's doing. But of course, after that, there's, there comes in an enormous number of problems in the way that he sets about his task. And one of those, just before we get too far along, I did find he uses the very beginning, you said that the metaphor that he uses to start his project is of a trampoline. So he and his friend think that the friend's parents have a trampoline in their bedroom and they go searching for a trampoline and they can't find it. And of course they much later discover, well, the parents didn't have a trampoline. They were having sex with each other because they were married. And then that metaphor he uses as a, as a way he wants to have the reader you know, jump up off of the trampoline and into the great mystery uh, of union with Christ. And that starting point really, I found problematic for two reasons. One, that idea of a trampoline is a very low, kind of lowbrow metaphor. So he's kind of, she's trying to get you to go up into the mystery of Christ. But the 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 tone of the book and the writing itself is is so colloquial and in some cases kind of flippant and this idea of a trampoline is so uh, I still have been struggling to find words to describe it I don't mean to say low brow like in a classist sense but it's a really not a good starting point 
um, to, to, to try to elevate the mind up towards the mystery of Christ in the church. Um, that's one thing that just really, I found not a good way in. And then I also, my second sort of immediate problem that I had as he began his task was uh, that the idea of pulling back the veil on something like this, because a mystery in the Bible is something that Christ reveals himself. You know, you, there's mysteries that you come to find out as God's revelation unfolds through history. And I don't think, you know, when you read that marriage relates to Christ in the church, I think people kind of sort of can immediately get that. And I don't know that we need somebody to come up along and pull back the veil in the way that he has. I don't think that's, that's not quite what the call is. And so I, I think, you know, he, he start, his heart is in the right place, but then right from the get go, he just has some serious missteps that he doesn't recover from. I will say that um, I wasn't going to mention it in particular, but you did that it was the trampoline example that was curious to me because um, I listened to the, I mean, I listened to the talk first before I looked at the book and um, he mentions that. And in the talk, he kind of like laughs about it, but the audience was not laughing with him. I did note that they didn't kind of find it funny. And I think by lowbrow, I think you just mean humor that, and that is the context, right? He was like maybe 10 or 11 years old, something that a 10 or 11 year old boy would be find funny later in years or something like that. Kind of that kind of humor that little kids are into at that time. Um, But I did not think that that was the right analogy, I guess, to describe this. Um, And so I thought it was unusual that he didn't even from that talk in 2018, all these years later after his research would continue to put forth that example, which I don't know if that was the best choice for him to do. What yeah, I don't, just sorry, like that would have been as a result of that talk, many people in his circle could have maybe said, hey, find another image. <laughs> so it's curious to me that that, you know, that that didn't happen, that he persisted in that. And yeah, I just I that has sort of stuck in the back of my mind all of these weeks as I've interacted with the material. And to your point about the style in which this kind of book is written, his speaking style is very much like his writing style. So like you said, it it is, I guess you're expecting a, a little bit more erudite treatment, especially in the people that he quotes, including Alvin Plantinga. It just doesn't seem to go with the rest of the tone of his book. But I will say that, again, it's curious, like you said, you know, it went through editors and all these kinds of things. But you mentioned the primary image that he starts in the introduction with is that he wants to make this an icon of marriage, is an icon of Christ's relationship with the church. And I think that's really important when we discuss a little bit more in depth some of the phrasing that he uses or the imagery that he uses. And he barely mentions it. He talks about iconography just briefly, prints a picture of, I think, Eastern Orthodox icons in there, but doesn't really get into the iconography or what that is even about. He just makes that statement and moves on with the rest of the book. And I do want to tell our listeners that we are having an in-depth, more than 6,000 word article on the whole idea and notion as regards this book about iconography by Elisa Riddell, and that will be um, published along with Anne's review, but today we're just going to be talking about Anne's review. So getting into the book more in particular, what are um, some of the topics that he covers in the book? It's divided into three sections that, again, I I thought the outline of the book was good. It's a good way to lay it out. Uh, He talks about sex, kind of what it's for, why it's supposed to be beautiful in the beginning. Then he has a long section called When God Says No. And that, that, those chapters I found to be pretty helpful. I I liked his tone in those, how he was very compassionate and um, pastoral. And so he, 
he talks about the big issues of the day, uh, pornography, rape, divorce, um, same-sex marriage, um, just a lot of the, the, the issues of the day. Um, he, he gets into when you, um, infertility, adultery, fornication, all those he, he, um, deals with in those sections, um, in, or in that section of when God says no. And then, and the last part is called a greater vision. And most of the theology is in that last section. Um, the parts that I found to be most difficult to deal with, or that are probably would lodge a fair number of disagreements with him about what he said, how he uses the Bible and what he says is in that last section. And so he covers a lot of ground. It is theoretically, it would be really helpful to have a book that did deal in a, in a very positive way, even with the parts that are dysfunctional. His, his, his manner is, is really kind. It's not condemnatory at all in those sections, but, um, but then it's balanced by very explicit language that destroys a lot of the metaphors that he's trying to work with. I do want to ask you about that. I don't know for our listeners that we should actually read these passages because they come across uh, as quite graphic, um, sexually graphic. And so what are the, some of the biblical images that he is using to describe sexuality and in particular, how that will show us what it means to be united to Christ? He deals with all of the the images that you do find in the scripture that are, that might possibly relate to sex. And then of course, many that don't relate to sex. So in the beginning, he talks about the sort of meeting of two different kinds of elements. So water and land, a tree coming out of the earth, the day and the night meeting rivers, a river flowing through a valley those kinds of natural images he talks about. He also pulls in the word and the seed images in the scriptures. He he ta- has a long section about the Trinitarian view of the family. Uh, the Trinity is sort of functions as an analogy for, for the family or the other way around really is the way that it should be. And there are long sections. Um, he, he deals with the, the uh, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh kind of image that appears in the Old Testament. And then he has a lot of, uh, a lot to say about the temple and which he relates to Song of Solomon uh, pretty closely. So he really is conversant in the scripture and he pulls in a lot of biblical images, but the way that they are handled, I, I wouldn't say is quite proper or the way that one would hope that they would be handled. Well, Anne, you have an MDiv, so we did want to ask you about how he is exegeting these different um, passages in Scripture. So he does use those images, but then he sexualizes them. Is that, if you do a reading of those texts, is that how they should be read? Well, I would say that what, I again, I feel like I'm stumbling for language because he in every case, in many, many paragraphs and sections, he would say a lot of things, true things that many people say about the scriptures. But then suddenly the conclusion that he would draw would almost turn the whole thing on its head. And so over and over again, I just sort of felt, you know, I'd be reading and thinking, yeah, okay. But then shocked by the conclusion that he would draw. And so I think in many, many cases, he and again, he's saying that he's not doing this, but the way that he writes and the way that he handles the image, it happens over and over again, that these various metaphors in the scripture are meant to draw the reader or the the listener up towards Christ to be elevated, to see behind the veil in some sense, to see who God is through something, through an image. But in so many cases, it, it actually circled back and it collapsed back so that it's almost like God becomes a metaphor for sex instead of sex pointing you to life with God. So that's one kind of 
that when you're reading the Bible, you have to be careful. I mean, there are a lot of things you have to be careful to do. One, you shouldn't collapse every image together in the scripture. So the subtitle of the book is how God's vision for sex sort of explains everything. Well, I would say, no, not everything in the Bible can be reduced down to the question of sex. Many images in the Bible don't relate to sex and don't have to relate to sex. One that I found particularly um, he misused was the question of rivers and streams. So he talks about the temple. He, he weaves all these images together. They're, they're sort of tightly wound. He relates, he talks about the temple and how God and humanity meet together in the temple in the same way that a husband and wife meet together in their sexual life. And then the stream, the river that runs through the temple is therefore a river, much like, um, you know, I don't even really want to talk about it. <laughs> so a man and a woman being together. So I, I like I've, just a little bit of study you, and just reading the texts themselves, you can see, especially with this, the river in the temple, that that river is about drinking water. Jesus is offering himself when he stands up in John and, and says, I am the living water. And he says it to the, to the woman at the well. That's water to drink. Yes, you do want to have union with Christ, but there are different kinds of, there's different ways of thinking about that union. And one of the major ways in the New Testament is eating bread and drinking water and drinking wine. And those, right, you would have bread and wine at a wedding, perhaps, or a Passover feast, but that's not about sex. And it's okay to say, oh, those images are not sexual in any way. And the way, be, by sexualizing them, even though, again, I don't think he would say that he's doing this, it becomes about the individual person's relationship with Jesus. And there's this, it's inflected, or there's an overtone of sex about it. And that's not true. The church together is the bride of Christ, and it's not a sexual relationship. Um, so man doesn't need to worry about becoming a Christian because Jesus is the bridegroom and he might think, well, I don't, I don't want to do that. Um, he, he is part of a corporate body and then it's metaphorical. So you don't, your mind doesn't have to go to the sexual act in order to contemplate the mystery of Christ's union. Um, and if you're uncomfortable doing that, that's okay. It's, I think you should probably should be uncomfortable. Um, so it just... I, I, the Bible likes to make, the writers of the Bible often mix their metaphors. Jesus often mixes his metaphors. But that doesn't mean that you can collapse all of the metaphors to be only about sex. So that's just sort of, I feel like I could go on about this for quite a long time. But that's quite a big thing to think about. I think a lot of times Christians don't understand the different kinds of literature that's in the Bible. They don't understand. And that's why, where we have gotten some erroneous teachings to think, well, if it says that God sees, you think that God has eyes. Well, God doesn't have eyes. And so it, it gets confusing to people, but it seems to me that he's trying to make everything that shouldn't be literal into some kind of sexual imagery about the nature of the relationship that we have, because especially in the Old Testament, he goes and says, well, these are the different, what, what is being said in these passages is a sexual thing. And so therefore, now I'm going to apply that to um, what's happening in our relationship with God. Yeah. I mean, right now I'm reading Hosea with my Bible study. So in Hosea, the question of sex literally comes up. I mean, we're going to have to talk about adultery and idolatry are, are wound together. God explicitly makes the analogy that worshiping false gods is like cheating on your spouse. And so when you worship Baal, you're cheating on God. And so that is a point in the text where a discussion you know, I would never read that book, for for example, for my um, 
family devotions at night, <laughs> even with my teenagers, because it would be embarrassing. Maybe a men's Bible study or women's Bible study. I mean, I'm, and I'm sure good sermon series have been preached on that, but you have to be really careful because God is making an analogy. He's uh, letting you in on uh, what it's like from his perspective when you decide to worship false gods. And certainly one could also say that sex is an idol today. It's a, it's the thing that we're most obsessed about. Uh, but then you can't go over, jump over to the life of Jesus, who again calls himself the bridegroom. His first wedding, his first miracle is at a wedding. Still, with all of that, you can't collapse everything and say that everything is about sex. <laughs> you have to take each image, each passage, and consider it on its own terms. And I don't think, it, again, I don't think he intends to, but the way that he deals with water, you should be careful with his exegesis because. The word womb, he deals with it towards the end. That just because the same word is used for womb and for stomach in the New Testament, for example, doesn't mean that when the English translator picks the word stomach, that he could have picked the word womb. In some cases, you can't pick the word womb because it doesn't fit the context. And so, you know, he, he sort of makes a, a big deal about how, oh, look, this word in Greek could be translated into English, either womb or stomach. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Well, no, it's not amazing because some of the time you can't use the word womb for it. And I think there's there's other exegetical things like that where he just isn't careful. He has an idea of what he wants to say. And so he's making the text say those things, even when the text really doesn't say them at all. I was going to ask you about the whole womb thing, because in your review, you talk about him comparing the Holy of Holies to a woman's womb, which is really novel to me. I mean, I've never heard it explained that way before. And so how does he suddenly start using all kinds of things that happen in a sexual act to suddenly apply it to things like the atonement and the actual holy of holies in the temple. This is where, I mean, I was grateful that you let me uh, read the, the other reviewer because she pointed this out to me and I was so uncomfortable with what he said about the womb and I was sort of spinning and she pointed out, and I, I've read this in other places that there was one womb that was a literal, if you want to say that literal holy of holies, when Mary was pregnant with Jesus, she was the tabernacle that held God's presence when Jesus became incarnate. And that if you wanted to find a holy of holies that wasn't even really metaphorical, Mary, while she was pregnant, was the dwelling place of God. Okay, so there was one room that you could call a holy of holies if you wanted to do that. And some people do. So I guess that's okay. But no other woman ever, ever needs to think about her womb being a holy of holies. And um, because it's not God, that's not how God comes to live with us. Uh, he comes to live with us through the Holy Spirit by the shed blood of Jesus. Um, he draws a line between God meeting with his people in the, in the tabernacle or in the, in the temple and the holy of holies through to um the uh, the the woman potentially shedding blood the first time she's she has sex um through to the cross where Christ said sheds his blood that's a line that isn't there to be drawn uh God does come to dwell with his people. And he, that's one way the tabernacle and the temple were full of images that are meant to help you understand how close is your union with, with God and what he intends for you. Um, the kind of, you're going to live together in perfect peace and he will redeem you. And um, all of the elements of salvation and redemption are there in the temple to be seen as pictures of what was to come in Christ. Christ completely fulfilled the temple. So 
that's one thing. It doesn't need to be sexualized in order to make sense of it. Another set of images that he uses are the bridegroom, the marriage, um, and the, the relationship between a man and a wife. That's another set of images. Then there's images surrounding food, the bread, the wine. Um, then there's images of the wheat and the seed falling into the ground. And those, all of those sort of clusters of images don't have to relate exactly back to the sexual relationship between two people. Um, and I, it really bears repeating again that God did not have sex with Mary in order to bring about Jesus. That's heresy. Uh, so when you think about Mary being um, the dwelling place of God while he was um, while she was pregnant, it w- it's heretical to say to, to sexualize that in any way. That's not something we're invited to do. So why do you think that, like you said, he really presses home this thesis, the entire book, and just the idea that originally it was supposed to be part of something that the Keller Center for Cultural Apologetics. So you talked about how our culture right now is very much almost obsessed with sexuality and identity through sexuality and sexual expression, I would say, most. And so what was he hoping that this would bring that would it draw people to Christ to to think about this metaphor in such a graphic manner? I mean, I think he thought, I think that's what he thinks he's doing. He's taking the thing of the day and he's showing how its origins are Christian, which they are. Uh, but then I, it seems like he takes it in its sort of pagan secular sense and, and applies that over the, over the text almost Um, I mean, again, I don't think he's doing that intentionally at all. And much of what he says is completely orthodox, you know, insofar as God um, discusses his relationship with Israel as unto a man who's being cheated on by his wife, then you can go there. Uh, But I, I feel like he has so many modern assumptions about sexuality that just come into his reading of the text and it and, and, and create and creates um, connections between things that don't necessarily bear out when you're actually reading the reading the text but yeah I think he must be you know he he has a desire it, it comes clear in in the reading that to um, restore something beautiful to people that could, show them who God is, but because it's so dysfunctional and broken, it isn't. It isn't showing people the icon or the picture that's promised. So I think if he had maybe thought of it as a work of restoration and tried to re-articulate what so many people have already said through the centuries, I think he probably could have done a really good job, but I think he was trying to do um, perhaps something novel that isn't really justified. And the title of your review for us is called Upside Down Metaphor. What is, are the theological dangers for getting metaphors uh, for God and our relationship with God inverted upside down from what it should be? I mean, I think there are absolutely dangers. And I, I think that, it, you know, one of the if, it's sort of ironic, Israel really preferred to put an Asherah pole in the ground and sacrifice its children rather than worship God obediently in the temple where he wanted to be worshiped and where his holiness and his justice were supposed to so um, transform them that they would be a picture they to the nations. When people looked at Israel, they would see what kind of God they worshiped but they preferred other gods who were often demanding and could, there was definitely perverted kind of sexual practices involved with pagan worship at the time. So I think if you get the image wrong, if you look at it the wrong way or you, or you tie it, you turn it around on its head, you do end up with, it just feels to me at the end of the book, like um, he was, 
making God into a metaphor for sex instead of um, seeing that sex occasionally, sometimes metaphorically can be considered um, as a, a way to see who God is. He just, it just, every time he started to work with it, he, he kind of over, overdid it every time and it, and it, and it failed in its function then metaphorically. Um, I mean, I've talked to, um, I mean, if you, for those who are Catholic, the theology of the body works out a lot of the kinds of things that he talks about. Uh, and I, I don't know, some people find it helpful. Some people don't find it helpful. Um, I haven't read through theology of the body, but, um, I, it feels to me like perhaps he, he got a little taste of that as well as some iconography from other traditions and got excited, felt that it explained everything and really didn't consider the, the depth of the images themselves um, and what they're for and how they, how they do in fact point you to Christ. Um, I think one, just one final thing on that subject is that, I think for those people who are married, uh, it's kind of ridiculous that God would liken his relationship to the church to be like that of marriage because marriage is hard and uh, it, it's not, it doesn't go in a straight line. It's a mystery on its own. How men and women can even relate to each other is, is very difficult and uh, it takes a lifetime to figure out how to live with another person. All of those different elements of marriage, the two married people can consider and ponder quietly to themselves. They're not invited to then make doctrine out of their personal experience of what marriage is like, even though many of the things that happen to people in marriage might point to something that they might discover in the gospel. Uh, so, you know, I've given birth six times each time I've given birth, I've learned something about who Jesus is and what the cross is like and how we're saved from sin. But I don't think that it would be appropriate for me to say any of those things uh, in a formal way to the church <laughs> uh, or to have anybody make some kind of big statement about them because they're quiet revelations as you have a relationship with God that you discover who he is in the the pain and difficulty of life um that's not an invitation to to be explicit and to make it um sort of codified for everyone else so some christians might come across this book not knowing about the controversy or all the things that ensued out of that controversy and might see it in their local Christian bookstore and pick it up because despite the controversy, the publisher did go ahead and publish the book in April of 2023. Or somebody like some of the different teachers Anne and I have discussed in the past, whether it be Jen Hatmaker or someone else, has said, this is a great book. This is a Christian book about sex and marriage. And you're, you know, you might be having some marital problems right now. You should read this book. It's really great. And they wouldn't know. And so they're just reading through all the ways he's handling these metaphors. How would you recommend that Christians should handle the scripture so they don't kind of apply it the way in which he's applied? I mean, how do we handle the various metaphors about God that the scripture does have? And he does have some, as you mentioned, because you talked about Hosea. So how should we really read the scriptures and, and handle the scriptures so that we don't fall into error theologically? I think there's two, well, there's many things we can do. One, as you already said, you can make sure that you're keeping the genre front and center as you're reading a text. So, I mean, I've just felt this strongly when he was talking about how everything relates to sex and the blood of the crucifixion also relates to sex. Well, it doesn't, though. The metaphor in that case is of wine that flows into the cup that you drink. It's about the wrath of God. and the metaphor is about food, which is not the same as sex. And so just the Eucharistic, I think he, he loses track of, of some deep, rich theological um, concepts because he is trying to make everything about sex. So one thing to do is to keep which kind of genre you have 
in front of you all the time as you're reading. Second, I think that it's really helpful when you're reading the Bible not to project yourself onto the text. In The text isn't about you. It's about real people who really existed in time and space, and you're reading about who they are and what they did, whether they were obedient or disobedient. And the teaching portions of scripture are supposed to inflect or, or give you a sense of what the story portions are going on about. So I think this is very hard for people today who think that because the Bible in some sense is about you, you're invited into the family of God to know Christ. But in a very real sense, it's not about you because it's actually describing the real circumstances of other times and places. So you can push your typology a certain distance. There's a lot of pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. But then you kind of have to back off and say, oh, well, these were actual people. And so I need to be reading it with that in mind. And then I think the thing that I always say to people is don't make something either too difficult that's simple and don't make something simple that's difficult. <laughs> so how you read the Old Testament is a, is a difficult. It's hard to read the Old Testament. It's hard to read the Gospels. It's hard to understand who Jesus is in some sense. It's also very simple to see that Christ is God if you have the eyes of faith to see as you're reading the text. So your personal experience of sex isn't really a window into the divine. <laughs> uh, I guess that's what I say. Like when you're having your marriage, that's not your special revelation of who God is. The scripture is that. And then you read the scripture and let your understanding of yourself and who God is be transformed by what you're reading. And that will tell you about your own relationship and your own life, your physical life, your spiritual life. And that, so I think he, he takes it the wrong way. I've said that several times. You don't look at your sex life and then know more about God. You look at the scripture to understand who you are and your relationship with him. And then you, you should also just one final thing, not take things that are about the corporate church or corporate Israel and make them personal. And likewise, if something's about, a, you know, what just one person, you wouldn't want to say that that's about a whole group. So I think he also unwittingly makes corporate ideas about the church to feel very personal and individualistic. And that's going to cause confusion as you read the text. Well, this has been a very fascinating discussion about this book. And we definitely recommend Christians not to read this book or have them in any kind of marriage classes. I think that would just confuse the issue. But on a much lighter note, I have for Anne, we're about to head into summer. And so what is one of the most memorable vacations you've ever taken? Well, last summer, my husband and I took all of our kids. We had a sabbatical and we, we went to uh, Portugal and Spain for three weeks and that was really amazing. It's still, uh, I still haven't gotten all my pictures online. And I, uh, I can't believe that we actually did it without losing any of our kids or um, falling into problems. But it was a wonderful trip. Well, thanks, Anne, for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to episode 343 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Journal. And today's guest was Anne Kennedy. She has written an online exclusive feature book review for the Christian Research Journal. And her book review is called The Upside Down Metaphor. She is reviewing Beautiful Union, How God's Vision for Sex Points Us to the Good, Unlocks the True, and Sort of Explains Everything by Joshua Ryan Butler. You can read her review of Beautiful Union at our website, equip.org. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. 
You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Hanegraaff. And in that podcast, he has really in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that. And every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching.